Feeding kids can be like dealing with the fussiest of food critics. SW food science students were asked to invent new foods for a national competition, they bravely chose the toughest market of all. Kids! After all, if you can please these guys, you can please anyone. This group of food scientists is taking the sneaky route to winning them over. They're planning to insert two daily vegetable servings into bread a product that 90% of Australians eat. This one's called V-Bread. Yeah, the majority of Australians are not having their daily servings of vegetables, so we've decided to incorporate vegetables into, the, into their staple diet, which is bread. The, the dried vegetables uh, consist of pumpkin, corn, sweet potato and carrots. These students are going straight for the sweet tooth. Our product name is Bubble Rice Grain, and it's like a combination of the bubble, uh, bubble rice and also the ice cream. Yeah! Both groups are vying for top spot in the product development competition run by the Australian Institute of Food Science and Technology. Basically, it's to encourage students from around Australia to come up with a unique food product. It's a tight deadline for the students. This is the product they're taking to the finals in Melbourne, so it's important to turn out a perfect sample. Mm. 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 This, this not bad. Mm. This exercise is not about creating a new generation of master chefs. It's about creating professional food scientists who can create foods that may one day end up on our supermarket shelves. In order to do that, the um, products need to have a much longer shelf life than if you're just cooking it for them and eating it immediately. So. Microbiology is important, as is chemistry. In order to make the things, you have to uh, study some aspects of engineering and mathematics. Um, we have to be very careful with nutrition, so the students study nutrition. So there's a variety of fundamental sciences that the, that the students study. Technical challenges with these products included getting the moisture content and texture exactly right. No unusual colours? No. Looks good. Mm. Also, we have to choose certain vegetable products that didn't uh, bring out the so-called the vegetable taste that most children don't like. The foods are about to undergo sensory evaluation in the tasting lab. It's part of the normal procedure when you're cooking up a new product. But how successful have they been? The only way to find out is to ask the critics. It's awesome! It's great! It's fabulous! Does rugby headgear prevent concussion? A team led by Dr Andrew McIntosh from the University of New South Wales has just published the results of a major study into this important question. We observed a lot of players were wearing headgear. So you go and see a game of rugby on the weekend, a, like a schoolboy game or a community rugby game, and there was increasingly proportions of players wearing headgear. And we wondered whether there was any evidence that it was effective in preventing head injury and especially concussion? I'd say that, that headgear is pretty good. I mean, I haven't had any problems. Uh, people who wear headgear tend to get concussion left. You see guys on television who get knocked around. Majority of them wouldn't be wearing headgear. A lot of guys, you know, swear by it. I guess it's just a preference thing, you know. Some guys prefer to play it. Some guys find it, find it uncomfortable. And I guess until you get your head knocked about it, you don't really think about wearing it too much. So. We undertook what's called a randomised control trial that gives the best evidence for the effectiveness of an intervention. In our case, the intervention was whether headgear prevented concussion or head injury. So we had a control group. We had a group wearing standard headgear. In addition, we had another arm where players were allocated uh, what we called modified headgear. Well, the modified headgear has, uh, is, has thicker foam inserts and the foam in it is denser than this uh, standard headgear. We recruited about three and a half thousand participants, some of whom played in both seasons.
what we found in the study was that padded headgear does not prevent concussion and doesn't prevent head injury. But in terms of more major head injuries, like a, a laceration that would be bleeding and it might need to be sutured, or a concussion or injuries which stop the person playing the next week, headgear doesn't make any difference to those injuries. It doesn't change the incidence of those injuries. The findings that were true for this, which is a standard headgear, and to a large extent true for this modified headgear. What we did find that was that there was a trend with this headgear that there was a reduction of more than 50% in the, the incidence rate of head injury and concussion leading to someone missing a game. But because of the study running for two years and our sample size, that was not a statistically significant finding. It would surprise me because, um, like I said, I, I haven't had as many problems. A lot of times it sort of depends on how you play the game, you know, like guys that really get in there and, and play rough, I've seen them get knocked out with headgear as without headgear. We need to return to the laboratory to do more work looking at the mechanics of head injury and then try and match material that's around like polyethylene foam that's in this, the right density and thickness to the dynamics of the impact that are occurring in a, in a, on the sports field. And I think that if we do that, we can then improve the, the quality of the headgear. My brother plays first grade for Sydney Uni. He went into a ruck, was on the side in the second row, uh, stomped on his head and he actually had his ear ripped off and had to have a, a microsurgery to sew it back on. So, you know, th there's a few other reasons why, besides concussion, that it's quite useful to have a headgear. So you're leaving your headgear on? Yeah, I think I'll leave my headgear on for a bit longer. Rather than just making things functional and sometimes fun, design is moving into a whole new realm of sustainability. And that's the interest of my next guest, Selena Griffith, who is a senior lecturer at UNSW's College of Fine Arts. Selena, first of all, what is sustainable design? Ah, oh, well, no design is sustainable. <laughs> um, all design that we uh, create uh, uses resources and energy to produce and as such uh, it has an impact and so sustainable design is about looking at the social the economic and the environmental impacts of the design that we do and minimizing the harm in that process isn't that up to companies rather than designers to do that well it should be I think sustainability stems from an understanding of what needs to be considered and I don't think everyone in all disciplines and all companies are trained in this area but designers now are being more uh, heavily trained in this area and are more conscious of the impacts that they can have because designers are resource multipliers they're the ones that make the decisions about how much gets used and how it gets used whereas a consumer uh, only consumes a, a small amount in comparison so it's it's more imperative that the designers make these decisions in an informed way so so can you give me an example well packaging is a really good example uh, I think now we see more and more products coming packaged in a lighter way or with less packaging because it makes much more sense to use less packaging because packaging really only protects uh, uh, goods in transport and makes them look nice on the shelf and we discard it immediately. Uh, so it not only reduces the amount of materials that we're using but for the company it's a benefit because it reduces the expense of producing the entire product. A lot of the research that I've done recently has brought up a, a many case studies where it's much more um, financially viable than you would think and in fact in a lot of cases saves a lot of money for organisations. I think you've got 
got some interesting examples too, haven't you? Oh, I do. And one of my favourite is Cascade Green, uh, which is a beer produced by um, the Tasmanian Brewery Cascade for the Fosters Group. And they produced this beer with the intent to minimise the impact, in fact, to have a completely carbon neutral beer, which sounds kind of funny, but there is definitely a market for such a boutique beer. And they've been able to uh, sort of document and they have voluntarily complied to a, a number of environmental standards and undertaken life cycle analysis of the product development and produced a product that is carbon neutral. Everything that they couldn't offset in the process, they've bought um, carbon offset credits and they've lightweighted the packaging so the glass bottle is much lighter. They've used industrial designers to design that. They've worked with the graphic designers to um, select paper stock that's recycled and recyclable to use soy-based inks uh, and to minimise the number of colours that they're printing with to, but to still have effective packaging which reduces material usage as well. Uh, source the ingredients as much as possible locally in Tasmania. Uh, so, so things such as hops and water and, and other ingredients that you put into your beer. Uh, they won't tell me all the ingredients, I'm sure it's a secret recipe. <laughs> um, and uh, looking at the different types of brewing processes to minimise the amount of energy that you need to keep, say, the yeast warm um, in the brewing process. Now this has uh, generated a huge amount of knowledge that they've been able to share within the entire Fosters group, which has assisted them to make efficiencies in nearly all of their other products and it's no more expensive. So I take it from what you're saying to me that sustainability in design is not just a fad, it's here to stay. Every year for the past seven or so years we've had an exhibition on sustainable projects that students produce and what we're finding now is nearly all students are producing pro uh, projects that consider sustainability. These guys are filtering into the workforce. So I think sustainability um, from a design perspective will be embedded as an integral part of practice and not be thought about as a separate consideration. So does it mean that we'll, as consumers, change our attitudes to things as well? Well, consumers are changing their attitudes and a lot of it is through education and you will often notice on packaging it says this is printed on recycled material or we've used soy-based inks or um, we've minimised that and then this calls for, um, just as we have our cal calorie counts um, on the back of our uh, food packaging that we should also look at, the carbon footprint, we're becoming much more literate at consumers in the considerations of sustainability and I think that's a result of good marketing because you have the green consumer, uh, the eco-sumer uh, rise, and also because designers are building these pieces of information into the work that they're doing. So yes, it's here to stay, definitely. We need it to happen more. Uh, it is happening more and more, and it is affordable for business to apply. Well, thanks very much for coming in, Selena. Oh, thanks for having me, Susie. In less than a day spent in hospital, this patient's eyesight will be restored. Stem cells from the patient's own eye have been harvested on this simple contact lens. This will be placed on the eye to overcome the damage caused by blinding corneal disease. Within weeks, sight will dramatically improve. It's a world-first technique pioneered by researchers at the University of New South Wales and colleagues at Sydney's Prince of Wales Hospital. The novel procedure, which is simple and inexpensive, offers hope to people with a range of blinding conditions that involve corneal damage from infections, burns and chemotherapy. It's a simple technique. It requires a small biopsy from a patient. It requires 5 mils of sera. Um, the cells are cultured over a 10-day period on a contact lens, so it requires no foreign human material or animal products. During the culture procedure, the tissue is firmly adherent to the contact lens surface. The pink solution is like fertilizer for the cells. The cells seem to transfer from the contact lens surface onto the patient's ocular surface. Once the stem cells have multiplied, the lens is dispatched to surgeon Dr. Stephanie Watson of Sydney's Prince of Wales Hospital. The procedure is relatively non-invasive. For the patient, they merely come into the hospital for a couple of hours and then they're able to go home afterwards. Uh, at the beginning of the procedure, we remove all the damaged cells from the front of the eye. Following this, um, we take the contact lens with the cells that's been cultured in the lab and simply place it on the front of the eye. Afterwards, the patient um, uses eye drops and then returns the next day and we examine the contact lens to make sure it's in place. The researchers are hoping the procedure can be adapted for use in other parts of the eye and even in other organs.
We're very excited about this technique because um, we think it might be applicable to other major organs of the human body, such as the skin, because after all, the skin behaves in a very similar manner to the cornea. My name's Steve Thompson. I'm uh, doing PhD in law and I'm also working full-time as well in, in uh, the legal field, actually the same area that I'm studying to do with prosecution appeals. The specific question is looking at the law and the practice surrounding prosecution appeals against sentence. There's been about 1,100 cases since 1925, so I'm looking at all those cases and the current practice and trying to analyse the law and get some principles because it hasn't really been studied in any great depth until, until now. I think that uh, I've just had an open mind really about um, universities and um, I've just felt very relaxed and comfortable coming into it. I find it's easy to work in with, with my uh, study, with my work commitments and um, it's also very convenient where it's located as well, easy to get to. Perhaps it could uh, assist if I'm going to go on to be an advocate. The career path for a prosecution solicitor like myself is, is fairly restricted because it's so competitive and um, there is some opportunity though to become a, a trial advocate and then from there become a Crown Prosecutor. So if I have an extra degree under my belt that would certainly help.